This week's episode of Screen Talk is sponsored by HBO, presenting Mare of Easttown, nominated for 16 Emmys, including Outstanding Limited or Anthology Series, and Outstanding Lead Actress in a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie for Kate Winslet. Welcome to Screen Talk, IndieWire's weekly movie podcast. I'm Eric Cohn, the executive editor, joined as always by Ann Thompson, our editor at large, and we've got plenty of stuff to discuss this week and uh it's fascinating because at this particular point in time it kind of feels like a pre-2020 sort of season in the sense that we've got some award season hype with festival stuff coming out we've got little tidbits of award season announcements that uh are gonna inform the months ahead so it's kind of i don't want to say comforting but it feels a little normal ish in the way that a pre 2020 kind of looks like i know that's not gonna stay the same indefinitely but how are you feeling about uh let's say the toronto announcements looking pretty good right yeah, they've got a robust lineup. I mean, um, a lot of questions are being asked, or as we discussed last week, uh, a little bit about, how, you know, what talent is going to go. Uh, Jessica Chastain is going to go because she's Somehow got a tribute, cross. an award tribute for, um, and I've been hearing a lot of buzz about the eyes of Tammy Faye as a kind of um, definitely a, a, an actress makeup slash costume hair and makeup performance, sort of like Charlize Theron, um, uh, you know, playing uh, Megan. Um, what was her name? The the newscaster that she okay. played in Bombshell? Oh. oh the Fox uh, News uh, Me- lady? Megan, obviously. Megan Kelly. Yeah. Kelly, 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 Megan Kelly. I know she's so, easy to forget when she's not on TV every night. Yeah, I, I, I don't think about her very much at all. So so the the point being that Jessica <laughs> Chastain transforms herself and is getting an award at, at TIFF. Uh, and, and they've done well with those uh, TIFF award tributes in the past. They wouldn't Walking give her Phoenix. the award if there wasn't if there w- something wasn't there investment yeah. yeah so searchlight is going to push that you know pretty pretty hard and and it's going to be a world premiere at toronto there have been rumors that it might be at, at telluride but it's going to be a an awards thing at 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 toronto and you toronto be also careful about those telluride rumors i right? know <laughs> i know toronto no you can tell all you have to do is look at what's a canadian <laughs> premiere or you know whatever international so, yeah. yeah yeah so th- speaking of which there's a list of documentaries that came out um from tiff and uh there's some good oscar possibilities there uh the the custeau becoming custeau from liz garbus which is um nat geo good old jacques custeau finally getting his tribute so they get to dig into the archives and have some fun on the calypso with all the merry band of of revelers on the open sea and then you have um Another set of divers, uh, as it were, in uh, the rescue, which is uh, from the people who brought you free solo. Yeah, um, Chai Verselli and, and Jimmy Chin. And I, so I can't wait for that one. That, that looks one like looks really good. Fun. Almost, I mean, it, the thing I loved about free solo was that it kind of crossed into this that other realm where even though it's not like reinventing the traditional rules of documentary storytelling, it's it's using them to create an experience that feels like it's more of a different kind of story and more more different kind of cinema like that was all it's like an action thriller sort of experience in documentary terms and the footage is just so extraordinary obviously the the thai cave rescue i mean that was one of the great real-time thriller so what we it, it, sort of like ace in the hall or something but but the mm. but the trick here is that that the divers had footage of their own that they shot and i actually saw a clip of the actual moment of discovery when the diver n- worrying and, and, and expecting the worst. And they had to go underwater through all of these tunnels and caves and crevasses. And they finally find the, the, the team sitting there and it's just heartbreaking. Um, yeah, so now Gio is pushing those two. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and the thing I'm really excited about with those, with those uh, is that it feels to me like these are movies that are going to be very, uh, theatrically oriented i mean especially the rescue which is you know was almost like i mean the free solo was like an imax movie i mean it really benefited from the when it had the imax treatment and so i'm, I'm i feel like it's going to be fascinating to see how festivals can be a platform for these films because obviously something like that's going to need that 
that kind of first time for the world to start talking about it, irrespective of how it launches. So, well, I think it's going to be at a couple of of different film festivals, uh, both of those. Um, And then there's also um, the opening nighter, which is Attica, uh, which is from uh, Stanley Nelson, veteran filmmaker, Emmy winner, uh, going into what happened there at the prison. And there's a related, interestingly, a related movie um, where uh, Hold Your Fire, which is about the longest siege ever, sort of like Dog Day Afternoon. Remember Attica, Attica from from Dog yeah, Day sure. Afternoon. So, so the, there's some films for sale as well. And then uh, Penny Lane comes back with Listening to Kenny G, uh, which is all about how you can have a uh, saxophonist like him who is equally revered and dismissed. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> I might, I, mean, I might idea, be in the latter category. Uh, well, I mean, actually. the very idea that I mean, it's like the fact that Kenny G, for a lot of people, feels like a punchline, like a cultural joke. Right. He's like opens up a lot of fascinating angles, and she's such a dynamic filmmaker. I mean, she's gonna have like fun nuts with it. Or uh, hail Satan. It's like she can make. I mean, it goes back to the point I was making. It's like she's not reinventing the rules of documentary storytelling, but she's bringing something to even that there there's a certain like bottom line audience member who's like oh i don't like documentaries as a category or something but there's an entertainment value baked into her films that i think it wins over even those people in the best possible situation so i was excited for that and also uh this film diva which uh which that looks good beautiful. that's a first time filmmaker and uh there's two films from that are for sale from first time filmmakers who are talking about their families um so uh biba is one of them and kamala is the other um and uh and we talked to tom powers who sort of explained that both of them uh, these young 30-ish filmmakers are trying to come to terms with how to break out of the legacy of dysfunctional families. So that, that they both sound really cool. And of course, Flea is there making its way back to the festival scene after being a, a big hit at Sundance back in January. And that's when Neon picked it up and it won the festival there. And so I think it's going to be cool to have that one kind of reintroduced because so much time has elapsed. So this is one where it's almost like they, they're going to build in new audiences. We were sort of part oh, of no, that that's definitely going to, there's going to be a few uh, Sundance movies that are going to have to make a comeback uh, in the award season. The front runners right now in the documentary race are Flea, which everyone will catch up with if they haven't already. Um, and, and Neon will do a big push for it. And then the other one that's, that's um, is, is Summer of Soul, which, which broke at Sundance, not yeah. playing in, in Toronto, but that's in the, in the race as well. well. It's on, that's one that's already on Hulu and stuff too. So it's very accessible accessible and and easy for to kind of continue to have around in that sense and they certainly did a big marketing push for it so it made a big impact but it sounds like a, a lot of these films could end up sort of complicating that conversation so it'll be fascinating well it, 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 there isn't that much of a conversation yet it, in a way this is i mean we saw velvet underground in Cannes or, yeah, don't or val that. val which is opening soon uh or both maybe in the conversation as well we'll see yeah yeah and there were some other sections at tiff that that hold promise i thought it was pretty cool actually that uh, the midnight section, which is certainly smaller than it normally is, is opening with the Palme d'Or winning film, Titane. Of course it is. Of I mean, it is. It's a great midnight movie. But Cannes didn't put it in its midnight section. You know, but it was a competition. They had the film. sense to recognize that yeah. it needed to be in competition. I'm glad they yeah. did. Yeah. But I do love when films like that, like genre filmmaking can travel to different kinds of places and have different identities. Like I remember when Lars von Trier's Antichrist was at Cannes, it was like, so controversial and divisive and all this stuff and then it went to like fantastic fest and all these genre <laughs> festivals and they just like embraced it and i feel like the genre crowd i mean this is a film that you know understands the nature of genre storytelling as a platform for exploring complicated ideas about identity and society and so forth and i think it's going to be really fun to see it kind of enter into that world which will then again lift it up to a bigger conversation hopefully for american audiences as well now is it an oscar contender you're not totally as convinced as i am but i I feel like there could be some real conversations there if it continues to play anywhere near as well as it did you know the 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 fact that you know a movie like promising young woman did as well as it did um you know there's there's room for the logic is there the new uh the new membership uh to be a little more uh forgiving and international than the old 
Yeah. And how cool is it also that we'll have the the first woman director to win the palm, Jane Campion, and and the second, uh, uh, Julia DeCorno, both kind of making the rounds this fall. I feel like there's That's a cool. lot. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And Power yeah. of the Dog could be a really big major. Uh, it's it's hitting yeah. every festival, but it, virtually. It certainly so. is. And we'll we also see. got the uh, New York Film Festival closing night, which is opening Venice. And that's Pedro Almodovar's film, Parallel Mothers. So uh, that another, looks like a strong, one, yeah. a strong candidate as well. I cannot really wait to see that one. It, I mean, sh- you, you it could, should be the Spanish submission for sure. One always hopes. I mean, I, I always say like with, with people like that, it's like you can't discount Pedro. I mean, this guy in the middle of the pandemic went and made his first English language film a short film. a short <laughs> and then comes back and makes this ambitious thing with penelope i think Cruz. that's on movie now if everyone hasn't seen it yet they should Highly look at it. it yeah totally yeah. snubbed by, by the uh by the academy too last year that was a real bummer uh so and then what what else uh in terms of uh, recent announcements we've got a lot of other things to dig through here so on the, well there's on some the, uh, debate about going to um CinemaCon in Las Vegas. Uh, yes. There's some questions about that. Uh, the studios are supporting the exhibitors. The exhibitors are insisting on having the 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 their annual convention, having missed it last year, uh, as they try to mount a, com- a comeback uh, as a business that's just being completely destroyed. Not completely, but impacted by COVID. And um, and they really want to make a strong stand and they the studios sort of have to go along with them even if they're reluctant to put their talent at risk so i'm curious yeah. to see how that plays out in a place that's rid- riddled with covid yeah it's a, it's not the most attractive place to to tell any kind of comeback story right now to be honest with you so well they say they're going to all demand you know that everybody wear a wristband and and go into the casinos you know they can't go to any events without the wristband that shows that they've vaccinated and they have to wear masks and everything but you're still inside those casinos. What can you do? Yeah, it just, it doesn't, it's not like, I mean, I, I said before, I weirdly felt safer at Can than I might have in other kinds of places because of all the precautions in place. I don't know if I really was safer, but it felt some safe. Of it is, it's a feeling thing first, I sure. think. Sure, I we, never we felt like I was effort. in a risky situation. Right. Again, but and then I again, the there. Delta variant wasn't. Yeah there so well, we didn't see it, it probably at least was it wasn't there. as yeah. as reported uh, there uh and and i'm in la where the delta variant is running wild so right right well i was thinking about this also with respect to some recent box office reporting i mean you look at everyone talking about jungle cruise did what 30 something million in box office 30 something million on disney plus and everyone's saying well not only was it because of day and date, but the Delta variant is scaring people off from going to the movies again. And I'm I'm curious to know how a conversation like this could unfold at CinemaCon in whatever form it takes. Because That's now why this I wanted to go. I really wanted That's to go and be course. there on the ground and talk to people and get there, you know, get them to talk about what's really going to happen with their industry. Would I discover that they're all, you know, kind of in denial <laughs> myopically <laughs> not seeing the real picture uh that's possible uh it's likely but, but you know, it would have been interesting what it just like i i always feel like i hammer this home when when these conversations come up is it, it's that if jungle cruise was an exciting enough movie to go see it wouldn't the day and date part of the conversation and the question of is movie going dropping off again because of delta fears I don't know if it would have been as prominent because like I haven't seen the movie, but like, is anybody really talking about Jungle Cruise as a must see movie? It got right pretty now? bad reviews. It got actually. really bad reviews. And so I'm, I'm I didn't go. Either. I was because yeah. I was supposed to go see it and I'd heard it wasn't and that good. So I didn't home, make the too. effort. Here's you the thing. You didn't make the effort to rent it on Disney Plus. No, I wouldn't do that. I mean, exactly. anyway, I, if I were going to go somewhere, I would see it in the movie theater. And uh, you know what's happened is for me to schlep up to Hollywood Boulevard. Got to be worth you know, it. It's it's got to be worth it. Gotta exactly right. Case. So I you don't mind going. Left. I go to screenings all the time. I'm going over to the to the Rodeo Drive or the or the Wilshire or whatever. Those are easy. But for me to schlep all the way to Hollywood or Burbank or someplace, it better be good. Well, but I think even though we are not the ideal case studies because we are journalists and spoiled. We're people, yeah, we're spoiled and we're privileged and all that stuff. I do think that if it's hard for you to see it, it's 
you know, all the more so unlikely for a lot of other people to be all that. They're not going to gonna schlep either it. unless They're they have a reason schlep. to believe it's really yeah. good. And F9, just they thought thing. would deliver the goods. And that's yeah. the biggest hit so far. Yeah. Which, this by year. the way, I finally caught up with on on. I still Pee haven't Bob. seen it. <laughs> <laughs> I have What's no my interest. What's favorite of the franchise? None. Um, None. Charlize Theron spends most of the movie in a glass box um with no bathroom so i didn't totally understand the logic of it but it was uh very amusing. i'm sure she was she equipped had a good time. <laughs> she has a very strange monologue about luke skywalker there's a lot obviously they go to space everyone knows that the problem i have with these movies is that they no matter how ridiculous they get they all start to feel sort of like the same thing like you could cross cut the last three of them and make a new fast movie which is maybe kind of a contemporary idea but that's the issue I have. I mean, I, yes, people went to see it and they had a good time. And I think the, the, the difference between that and say a Jungle Cruise type of movie, which again, we haven't seen, is that the fast movies, like they, they know what they're, they need to deliver and they deliver that really specific thing. I think a lot of these temp, other temples we see, it's like, they're not exactly sure who they're supposed to appeal to. And it just I know gets we're, lost. we're going to get to Suicide Squad we were going to get to it later, we but can. I think we should get to it now. All right, let's do it. Suicide let's Squad it. is exactly what you're talking about. Yes. James Gunn is a writer director. He is a quote unquote auteur. I'm going to apply that to oh, this God. because he knows exactly what he's doing. He's going R, he's going bold, he's going violent, he's going right to the edge of what's acceptable as as these um, characters who are released from prison by a uh, horrible boss, uh, <laughs> Viola Davis, government apparatchik uh, extraordinaire uh, to, to, and if they don't do, it's sort of like uh, Snake Plissken in Escape from New York. If they don't do exactly what they're told, they're, something is gonna explode in their neck and they show you what happens when that happens. So they're supposed to deliver uh, this on this mission and in the process of doing it, led by Idris Elba, who I adore, in the process of doing it, they get, you know, mow down thousands of innocent victims. And, and somehow James Gunn manages to, you know, twist it around so that you know uh, exactly where the moral lines are, are drawn and that the movie is conscious of, of exactly what it's doing and I, each know, character is used perfectly well. It's very I, well done. I, I, I mean, he's a very, he has a very polished kind of approach to, to the way that he does these men on a mission movies, which is why Guardians worked so well. It flows nicely. It's, it's got these, all these pop music cues. There's cer certainly a backlash to the persona and not just because of all the stuff he went through where he was initially fired from Disney for some old tweets or whatever, but also just because there's that. Well, he got in trouble this week over, well, you know, yeah. attacking Martin yeah. Scorsese. This, this was <laughs> he, exactly he hasn't learned I, his lesson yet. <laughs> this was what I was going to get into was that there's it's a it's a kind of a film bro -y mentality about things that I think is is frustrating because when you use the A word, yeah, there's something auteurish about James Gunn, but it's kind of like auteur in air quotes. It's like, here's me doing that thing again where I'm going to throw in like a quirky aside with the superhero you didn't think could be funny. And then he's going to use the F-bomb. And then I'm going to throw in a, pop, a punk rock music cue that you didn't expect to see. So there is something very almost like- But I would also say it. that that what we learned from the very beginning with the car is that he's incredible incredibly good at setting up frame frame shots you know framing yes. knowing how to make something there's look discipline. good there's knowing discipline. how to how to uh, mount a, an action sequence and there's some pretty big el elaborate uh, action sequences in this yes. and they're beautifully no. executed they, i mean i get off this is the sort of thing i get off on it, well, you know is just appreciating the mise-en-scene it, it's just well done uh, i and unfortunately it's it's done better i think than than the kind of the overall screenplay tropes that it does fall into i mean it is an overlong movie that that i think gets a little too carried away in its third act which is true of so many contemporary superhero films so but they much get permission to do that because it works because it works because the audience again if they're going to pay money and go see this thing they want a, a full meal and so it, it, it's it's a little overdone in that in that sense and it lost me towards the end but I did have a much better time than I would have expected, especially because it's, you know, night and day from the, the Look, David Ayer one, which is sort of humorless. And I will also say, 
I think, and that, it's better than me, the one uh, that Kathy Yan did as as well. But well, I but quite the, enjoyed that movie. I mean, I always feel like it's like the it's fascinating when you when you get to these movies that are they don't seem like awards contenders, but then you keep coming back to them in certain kinds of ways. And if somebody wanted to try to push for that narrative, I mean, in a weird time for awards. Why not push for that? It does. It certainly doesn't seem like we have a very awesome. competitive year um, mm -hmm. uh, in theory, at least right now. It looks like there's a lot. Of course, we're going to knock some of them out as we see them. So that's what the festivals of, are for. It's a yeah, it's like a, sure. a, a gleaning process. Did not did not want to wait for Telluride, unfortunately. No, it did not. So, um, so speaking of Oscars, so the Academy has elected a whole bunch of new leadership, as you reported this week. It's the most diverse uh, leadership in history. Um, so what exactly does that tell us about the kinds of conversations going forward now that we're not seeing quite as significant a push to increase? Yeah, the, the Academy, it's, it's an interesting time for them because, I mean, David Rubin uh, was reelected, although he only has one more year that he can serve uh, before he times out. Um, but they have um, a lot of, of challenges ahead of them. Um, and as they try to, uh, this is the year that they're going to have 10 guaranteed best pictures. This is the year, uh, which is good because there's a lot of movies uh, in contention. Yeah. Um, and this is the, you know, they need to go back and make that ABC telecast uh, a successful one. They can't afford to uh, stumble. Uh, they need to pull, prove that the Oscars are actually timely and relevant in a right. way that well, I don't we'll, think we know. We'll have a fun conversation about that as we get closer. What is what kind of TV could the Oscars be that wins people back? Because I know I, feel like I don't know that it's even possible. <laughs> I, don't, like, I have no idea just, because just it's sort of like it's sort of like they've managed to keep James Bond relevant all these decades, right? But there's something about the Oscars that are, you know, just um, anchored in some Billy Crystal past that that they can't escape oh from. Yeah, that's, the Billy Crystal legacy has become this weird sort of nostalgia that nobody really wants around anymore. But it's funny you mentioned James Bond because I always think about it as like, you know, there, there's nothing thrilling about the show as live TV and, you know, being there, it's a great experience, but the, but you don't feel that. It is a great experience a to be there. And I wonder how you can replicate that. I mean, I, what I loved about the pitch, not the show itself last year was when Soderbergh said, what if the Oscars were like a movie? And I kept thinking like, Oh, did they, did they script something that like, will we watch an actual 90 minute narrative wrap around that ties into the show or something like that? He delivered it with the opening sequence that, and that, that was exactly. about it, I thought you know, which, we which we going. found out he gave to Regina King a day or two before right. the actual thing. I, I mean, yes. but that's a sign of how fly by the seat of the pants this whole thing yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. Maybe if he had given it his full attention, uh, he might've done a better job. Well, we'll come back to that in the weeks ahead as, as we figure out. I think know, they're not going to make that mistake again. He's running the Oscars this year. We don't we don't know who's going to do the show yet. So they went to him to save them from the safety protocols. And and he he managed to deliver that much. Yeah. So in, in other awards news, we should touch briefly on the HFPA rules uh, that came around, which uh, I guess were expected. Uh, yeah, they were. They were the ones mean, that everybody, they just had to vote them through. Um, yeah. And everybody was kind of saying that they weren't going to do it. And they did it. And they, they did everything they should have done. The question is whether they're going to be let out of jail now by the... Um, I mean, for example, you don't Network. have to live in Southern California. They're going to be looking for new uh, journalists outside of of the uh, of the country, you know, who could come and, and join them. Um, you know, they can they can um, they're actively soliciting uh, people to uh, apply to join and expand, you know, so that they're not going to be, you know, only 90 people uh, they're They've expanded their board of directors. Uh, they've got a, a diversity and inclusion officer now that they said they didn't need uh, before. Uh, so, so, but the point is, is are the publicists going to let them out of jail? And what, it's the publicists who are holding right? them like in jail. We're saying, are they going to let them into fancy HFPA experiences where they get to hang out with famous people and go to junkets again? Because like, that's what, so what they do, it's not going to be an improvement. 
right? So what they're do what they're doing what what they what they are not doing is any kind of Golden Globe show this year. So if we're looking at twenty. Uh, 23, I guess, uh, would be when they're going to have another one, if they ever do. Um, no, they, they have not been able to have the press conferences that, that are their bread and butter. At, the reason they created this organization in the first place were that these lonely outcasts uh, from around the world, mostly Europe, uh, were were uh, not getting good access to celebrities, and so they you know they put themselves into a group, and yeah. they organized these That's foreign it. press conferences, yeah. Yeah. which have become notorious. And they don't seem to recognize. That's what I find sort of interesting. They don't seem to recognize the degree to which they are the subject of ridicule by all of the uh, publicity people and the stars that participated. Or in these know. press conferences that I, that I they were so the they were not they were not considered respectable journalists by well, many people I, but i would posit to you that maybe some don't recognize it maybe some do but like a big cultural problem we have is that change doesn't come easily to people who settle into a routine and feel empowered by it and their automatic instinct is to be defensive and not of course and just, it, it just it, that defensiveness has been such a terrible Achilles heel because we live in an era where the natural response to criticism is to, or the appropriate one is to listen, to be willing to change, to be responsive to the need to change. Certainly that's the what the industry is trying to do and fighting back with zero middle ground. I mean, you and I disagree all the time, but we also find common ground. That's the nature of discourse. And they, they have not entered into this in these terms until now when basically they have to do it or else Gone they have to do them. it or they will cease to to exist and exactly. they're the question of whether the publicists are going to let them continue what they used to do is is a big is a big question and they the people at the hollywood foreign press feel like they are and sasha stone of all people uh wrote about this you know they're somehow that, that it's almost like they're on a blacklist of some kind that it's equivalent to that, you know, that they're being, their livelihood is being taken away by these powerful publicists, which they seem to forget is that it's not being taken away by the powerful publicists alone. It's their clients who don't want to play the game. That's the problem. It's not, it's not the publicists, it's the clients. As and always, I don't think the HFPA is ready to recognize that at always, all. Famous people have the power, at least for now. In any case, so We've been going on a bit, but next week, I think we're going to have more festival news. We've gotten a lot of lineups already, but uh, New York Film Festival's main slate is right around the corner. And uh, we're just revving our engines for the fall. And so I hope you're enjoying being in one place for, for now, because uh, one way or another, we're, we're looking at uh, a hectic couple of weeks ahead of us. So I will see you then. All right. Bye. Talk to you later.